Hey everyone, and welcome back to Titanic Talkline. My name is Alexia, and honestly, I am just really excited about this interview, but I say this every time, and this time I'm going to do what I always promise to do, and keep it short, and just get right to it. I don't have preset questions. I just launched straight into things. So, uh, yeah, nice. if you just want to tell tell me your name and uh, give me a little, little, um, well, I know who you are. So why don't you tell me like a super abbreviated version of your Titanic story and then we'll just plunge along in. Um, well, my name is Angelica Harris. And um, actually, my real whole first name is a Angela Philomena Locasio. Um Angelica Harris is my pen name because it's a whole lot easier for people to remember. <laughs> Fair. And um, I was, I mean, I was born of Italian, line of Italian and Middle Eastern lineage. I am, you know, Southern Italian from Rome, Naples and Sicily. And then I have um, from the Middle East, I have Israeli, um, Israeli, Pakistani, and um, Albanian blood wow. in me, and I'm I'm really proud of my lineage. So you know, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm finding out a lot about my his about my family history. Mm -hmm. um, as many people have, you know, as you may have read, I am the the niece through marriage of Alberto and Sebastiano Paracchio, and um, I really enjoy. I'm. My husband's uncle asked me one day to, you know, to start searching for his brothers. And I was not even married to him. And uh, I said to his uncle Mo, I said, you know, I'm not even your, your niece yet. Right. I'm not even engaged to your, you know, your nephew. You're kind of asking some favors that usually you ask from the ring gang. Right, exactly. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, well, I see a lot going on between you and my nephew. I know you're going to get married. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because we were only, we were getting serious. And, um, I mean, the reason how this all happened is we were having, we had a beautiful dinner at the house on a very warm July day. Mm -hmm. We ate at the out of the out on the veranda of their house, and it was absolutely beautiful. Um, they owned a beautiful house in Peekskill, New York, and you know, my uh, John's uncle was a chef. And to give you a little background, as we all know, Titanic sister ship is the Olympic, mm -hmm. and I hadn't known until that day that Zemo was a chef on the an assistant chef on the Olympic, Ooh. you know, so there's his Titanic background there from him. Yeah. Lots. And then, uh, but to go back a little further, he was five years old when the Titanic sank mm -hmm. and he knew nothing about his brothers, but living in Fubina, Alessandria, um, in Italy, most of the time, if you were the, you know, the lower class citizens, you literally worked in the docks. That yeah. was your life. Working the docks, um, you know, dads brought their sons up to work on the docks and, the sh you know, in the shipyards and moms brought their daughters up to know how to, how to sew and cook. And um, they yeah, would take- The fisherman's wife. Exactly. But we're talking about, you know, 1912, which yeah. we're not talking about today where women went out and got jobs. Mm -hmm. Literally, um, Grandma Louisa, you know, took in extra work by sewing for other people or even by cooking for other people. Yeah. And it was always that vice, you know, that circle of life mm -hmm. kind of living where that's how they made their money. And that's how they were able to help each other in the towns by doing things by, for each other and sharing talents. You know, unlike today, we look for digital, you know, help or we sure. send everything out to the cleaners or whatever. You know, in those days, they looked to each other to help each other out and they would pay each other whatever they could afford or it was a barter system. Right. You know, I'll cook for you, I'll cook for you, you sew for me. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, it got done, mm -hmm. but, um, 
you know, Zio, Zio Sebastiano and Zio Alberto were brought up on the ship docks and mm-hmm. they were, they worked very hard, but Zio Alberto was the older one. He was three years older than Zio Sebastiano. Mm-hmm. And, but not only was he, not only was he working on the ship, on the shipyards, but he had a very cunning linguistic mind. Hmm. So by the time he was 13, 14, not only did he know his dialect of Fubine or the Fubine, Fubineza, you know, dialect, okay. he knew the grammatical Italian had to read and write it. He wow. learned that from the priests of the church when he would take classes on either Saturday or Sunday. Wow. And then, um, and then also, I'm sorry, I just want to put this on. Okay. No, do not disturb until because for some reason I'm getting a ting on it. Anyway, <laughs> so then, I mean, CMO was, um, I mean, CMO had watched his brothers go to work and want to be with them. But of course, he was a little boy, so he couldn't. How many? And he um... always looked up for except. Say, excuse me. I was gonna say, how many siblings were in the family? There's three brothers I'm, t- I'm keeping track of so far. Well, so far there was Alberto and Sebastiano, Giorgio, uh-huh. Matteo, uh-huh. okay, um, Modesto, and then there was only one daughter, who was Antonietta. Mm-hmm. So she was the only daughter who, who you know, would stay home. The right. other one, her, she would. The other ones would go to work or. Um, would do things around the house or such, you know, for their mom until they were old and quite old enough to work the shipyards. Right. And let's face it, by the time these boys back then were 10, they were working. That was going to be my second question was about how old it was. Like, I was going to guess between eight and 10, you'd be yeah, heading off down the, to the docks. Right. Exactly. They would work at the docks with their dads at the age of 10. And I mean, we didn't have, nobody had to worry about, you know, child abduction or whatever. Then we, the people came on, they worked. Boys learned from their dads how to work the shipyards. They learned, they learned how to work hard mm-hmm. and um, they learned the family trade, whatever the trade was, you know, for, um, for Carlo, you know, for grandpa Carlo, it was, mm-hmm. it was the, it was cargo cargo and you know victualling provisions and that's how alberto learned very quickly how to get the cargo on the ship and how to read the labels and because dad taught him how to read the labels but then you know as the labels would come in so say the labels labels couldn't all be in italian so some some of the labels would come in in swedish or german or spanish because they were being shipped from different you know from different countries sure or because passengers were from different countries and right. they were shipping on shipping on ships in their own language. Yeah. And um, Alberto decided that he was going to learn how to read these labels so that he could help more and make more money. And it worked because by the time he was 15, 16 years old, he knew four languages almost fluently. By that is himself. impressive. By himself just by reading the languages and starting to talk to the people who were, you know, shipping things she, in his broken Italian with their broken Italian or whatever it was before, you know what they were speaking the language and he learned how to read the labels. He learned, he, he learned how to open books and, and learn how to speak the language. Wow. And, um, I mean, he was very self-educated and very, very knowledgeable about his work. Mm -hmm. Um, But the nicest thing, too, was he was starting to be seen because Mm -hmm. of his hard work and because of his knowledge. He was starting to be seen by, you know, other by other companies coming on and off the ship. And the one who saw him the most was Luigi Gotti who was at the time, he was subcontracted on the Olympic. And when Luigi ended up getting the the subcontract for the Titanic, he knew we needed extra people to teach, you know, culinary and victualing and provisions. And he started seeing 
Alberto as that person who he wanted to invite to come along with him. Seems so, like a natural um, choice to me. Oh, yeah, it was. And he invited Alberto. He said to him, you know, um, he first spoke to his dad and he said, right. I need extra hands. And um, Alberto was invited to work on the Olympic and be trained on the Olympic. So he was trained on the Olympic. Plus, he ended up going to England and much to my, you know, much to Grandma Louisa's mm -hmm. um, chagrin, shall we say, <laughs> wasn't very happy about her oldest son being, you know, hauled off to London to live. Yeah. You know, she she wasn't happy to see her 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 own her oldest son leave the family, but it's her first baby. You know, first baby, and also it was my son's leaving me. Um, yeah, the fears of a mom knowing that her son will be far away. And this is again and, before iPhone, so you couldn't just uh, no FaceTime. Exactly, exactly. The only the only freak the only you know, communication frequency they had was either on a telegraph or uh, in letters. And right. at least, you know, with, if they had someone with a, a, a photographer, a, um, a camera those days, you know, they could have that person take a picture of them and put it in with the letter and say, you know, I'm doing well, this is what I look like. And then they had a way for a letter back, but in those days, it wasn't just, you know, you put mail in a mailbox and in two days the mail was there. Mails right. took months. The mail took months to get to someone's house. Mm -hmm. And, but um, Alberto began working with, um, you know, Luigi in his culinary school in London. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I finally found all of this out was after ZMO, started asking me to, you know, look for his son, his, uh, his brothers. Wow. The research was difficult for me. Very sure. difficult. First of all, the family didn't want to, the family didn't want to give me any headway at all. Mm -hmm. The dead, is, the dead are dead. Let them stay, you know, in their graves. And that was it. And then, um, other ones just said, you know, there was a lot of controversy around, you know, Titanic. Just leave it alone. We don't want to talk about it. Sure. But, you know, Zio Alberto, I mean, Zio, um, I'm sorry, Zio Modesto mm -hmm. wanted to know so much about his brothers that I could not turn my back on a man that yeah. wanted this information. I just couldn't. It was... So I kept forging on mm -hmm. and my husband and I were getting more and more serious. We ended up getting engaged and my, of course, ZMO looked at us and went, see, I knew, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, but then after we got engaged and we go for, you know, we go for dinner at his house. Um, he'd always have me sit next to him at dinner. Mm -hmm. You know, he would tell my mother-in-law, ah, and a daughter, you sit over there. I want to talk to my Angela. I want to know about, <laughs> I want to know what about my brothers. Yeah. And my mother, my mother would look at, you know, my, my, her brother-in-law and turn around. My mother-in-law would look at him and go, oh, <laughs> you know, in Italian, Mazna. All right. You know, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I would sit, I would sit over here. I would sit next to him and. Honestly, it was such a wonderful experience sitting next to him because not only did I learn about him, mm -hmm. I learned about, he learned about whatever I had to tell him, what I found in the library, what I found on microfiche, what I mean, right. and I'm talking about microfiche. I didn't find half of the, half of my, you know, research, nothing else but microfiche. Yeah. So I had to you know, take the microfiche out in the library. I had to sit there, read through it on the microfiche machine. Mm -hmm. And there was no copy and paste. There was sit down with a notebook and write. Yep. Yep. Was For it. anyone who's unfamiliar with a microfiche machine, it's basically an extremely large projector um, that stores a lot of newspaper 
articles, clippings. It preserves a lot of pages from newspapers. And she's right. There's no copy and paste. You just kind of have to flip through it on the machine until you find what you want. If what you want exists and it's on that disc. And if it is, then you have to sit there with your notebook and scritch, 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 scritch with your pen and write it all down by hand. There's no other way to keep that info. No. I'll go back in time a little bit. I, you know, people ask me how I fell in love with Titanic. And yeah, I was going to ask, did this start with the request or did the Titanic love come before the request and the request was just like an impetus to build on a foundation? No, it was, I, as I said, as I said to you earlier, I'm first and foremost an Arthurian folklore historian. I've written three books, three mythical fantasy books on King Arthur. All right. I want copies of all three of those. I've wrote. Um, sounds amazing. I called the, uh, they're, they're called the quest for Excalibur, Excalibur and the Holy Grail and Excalibur reclaims her king. The fourth book is in my computer in production and. Nice. And I love, I mean, I, in my, in high school, uh, because I was on the honors program, I took the two year program in Arthurian folklore when I was in high school with my teacher, Richard Ch uh, Charles Chahalis. And it was the mo one of the most wonderful, you know, experiences of my life. But towards the January before I graduated from high school, which was 1975, I'm dating myself, folks. Mm -hmm. um, mm. We had to pick something that we studied in school in our genre in world uh -huh. history that we were going to write about for our exit project for graduation. Okay. Now, mind you, I had all these notes already from two and a half years of study of Arthurian folklore in the studies right. of Mallory and Knowles and Chaucer and everyone else of the, the greats. Yeah. And here I am th straying away because we had learned about the Titanic that semester. And I fell in love with the story of the Titanic. And I thought, well, maybe I should just do a, a, you know, my exit project on the Titanic. Yes. So I made the proposal that I wanted to do it on the Titanic. And my teacher flipped on me. <laughs> you know, he, said, he said, Angela, really, you know, um, you're, you're not, you're, you are a world his, history teacher, I mean, a real world history student in my class on Arthurian folklore. That's all it's been for you. You are, you had ingested, digested and everything else, anything you know about King Arthur. And now you want to write about Titanic? You, I said, yes, I do. Because for some reason, she's just mesmerizing me and I want to know more. It sounds like you gave him a reset he in said, his brain okay. real quickly. <laughs> what? And he looked at me. Oh no, it was no, it wasn't a reset. It wasn't a realist reset, Alexia. He told me, he said, you are an honest student, right? I said, okay. yeah. He said, I'm giving you two challenges. You, he says, I cannot graduate you without you writing about King Arthur, because that is your world history group that That's you a requirement? agreed on before okay. you came into this class. So you want to write about Titanic? You're going to have to give me two reports for graduation. Otherwise, I can't graduate you. And I looked at him and I went, what? <laughs> you know, here I am, this 17-year-old kid, you know, taking on these two big research papers that I have to do with the end to, to graduate. And I'm thinking, you've got to be crazy. Ugh, but That is far bolder than I am. I would not I would have just been like, I would have had my little temper tantrum and be like, fine, I'll write about King Arthur then. And that would well, have been the end of it for me. <laughs> No, but I was so in love with, you know, Titanic that I figured, all right, I could do this. Well, I did it. I did write about King Arthur because I, I literally had the, my Arthurian final done that right. semester by the end of March because... I had so much research done and I had already started writing the paper by hand that I pretty well had it set to go. Mm -hmm. And I figured, all right, you know, as I'm very anal like that, if I have research to do or I have anything to write, I start months ahead to write it because I'm just 
I'm just very detailed mm -hmm. in my work. Oh, I wish I were like that. I'm a procrastinator. It's pretty awful. Well, that's why I'm a writer and a researcher. <laughs> but, um, but then I figured, okay, I could do this. And my, my research started like in the Darnell Library in, in uh, New York City, in the New York Public Library in this city. I had no choice but to go to these libraries. And like I said, you couldn't just go on in Carter or on a website to find things. You had to physically go to a library, sit there, mm -hmm. and ask for the books. And mind you, in the New York Public Library, you could not take information out just like that. You had to go to the librarian, give her the card with a Dewey decimal number, mm -hmm. and then they would bring you to the reading room because some of the books are so precious, they won't let them out of the library. Right. So you have to sit there for hours collecting information and writing it by hand and citing it. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's the New York Public Library book and it has... It's the, the New York Public Library Encyclopedia of Titanic. You have to literally go into that book, re, you know, do the do the paper, get the information, and cite it there, mm -hmm. or ask the librarian for a ticket of your citing, because that's how you cited. You had your tickets of citing from the library. Yeah, and no easybib.com. No, no, it wasn't. Well, let me cite on ProQuest or on JSTOR right. or on anything. You had to get your ticket for citing and you had to put those tickets together in the end of your paper. Mm -hmm. That was it. That's it. And, um, you know, sometimes I miss those days because it was a challenge, yet you had that physical feel of it all. Right. It was wonderful. But anyway, um, just to jump forward, I did the two papers. I got an A in both of them. I graduated I say, with honors. I, can, I don't know much about you, but I can tell you got A's in both those papers. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I proudly, I, not many people, well, everybody knows this now. I, I, I humble myself. I never finished college because of some family issues that I had when my dad, you know, unfortunately became very ill. And I ended up leaving school, leaving Hunter College in the second half of my sophomore year to go help my family. So I never went back to school. And I ended up, you know, life took over. I married my husband and other things happened, raising a child with Tourette's syndrome and whatever. And I, but I'm proud of myself that in 2017, I went back to Fordham University. I went back to college and I'm a I'm a senior undergrad this year at Fordham University. I'm really oh, proud of that's myself. Amazing! Congratulations! And, and um, at 65 years old, I've been on the I've been on the dean's list twice, and wow. I'm I was just inducted into the Alpha Sigma Lambda Honor Society in May. So I'm Congrats. nice. Now you could tell how anal I am in my work because <laughs> well, you know, that's good. If, it's, if, if it's not perfect, I don't like it, but, um, makes sense why they asked you, why he asked you to look for his brothers. He knew that you wouldn't just, you know, look under the covers and go, all right, they're not there. Exactly. I, but you see a part of me, there's a big part of me. I love research. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, I love to, to the dig. I love to go down. And even if I've never been down in, you know, in the abyss with Titanic, I've been there in books. I've been there in my mind. I've been there in my heart. I've been in the dig. I could, you know, because of my research, I could, I could literally look through the books and swim and, and go into the cabins and see everything. And uh, I mean, I've dug down watching documentaries about Titanic mm -hmm. and I've learned about her in that way. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with Arthurian folklore. You know, I, I love the dig. So I love to read about him and I love to read many books about him. Yeah. So it's for me, the dig and the archaeology and the research is very natural to me. Mm -hmm. And plus what also what some of my 
fellow students, fellow, you know, students don't like about me is that I've got this really good memory about things. And uh, because I've trained myself so much to memorize papers, you know, pages Mm -hmm. where it came from. But part of that memory comes from the background I have, because we didn't have copy and paste. We didn't have Kindle. We (laughs) took our notes on a notebook and we had to remember the pages that it came from. Well, we had to write down the pages. So we learned very well how to do that research, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But anyway, um, I've been I talking so start. much. Do you have any questions? Do I do. Start? I actually wanted to ask how two of your stories kind of ended. And I think they probably end together, which is we left the older brother in London studying. And you were telling me about how you'd sit next to your soon to be uncle and tell him about his brother's. How did, how did you end up finding them? And what did you find out about them? Well, um, again, I'm a reader. Mm-hmm. And I started not only taking out books from the library in my own public library here, mm-hmm. you know, here in Queens, but I started, um, I started ordering books through Barnes and Noble. And there was one book in particular that a friend of mine recommend and, and an author sh- that she recommended, she had said that, um, you know, Charles Haas and John P. Eaton write mm-hmm. books about the Titanic. So I went online and I did find on Barnes and Noble, this amazing book called Titanic destination disaster by Charles Haas and John P. Eaton. Okay. And, um, Jack Eaton, may he rest in peace. He was, you know, a prolific Titanic historian. But so I'm reading the book page by page. And on ch- page 93. You do have a good memory. There's this page that says that Charlie, I, I met Charles Haas a while mm-hmm. back. And I, learned, I I call him Charlie now. But <laughs> Charlie writes about in the book that there was um, a man named Luigi Gotti. He owned the a la carte restaurant and he also owned a culinary school in England. Right. So I went, I can't find too much information from the family. Mm-hmm. I only know what ZMO told me, but he's got the memory of a little boy, <laughs> you know, this old, because his family didn't talk about it much. Yeah. Let me that. see what, you know, what I could find. Did he even know they were on the Titanic? What? Zemo? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. Okay. But the, but the family did not want to talk about it with him and, you know, answer okay. his questions as he got older. Sure, understood. So he knew at least that they were on the Titanic, but I, I, I yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of that where the family just did, didn't want to talk about it. No, after the Titanic, you know, died. Mm-hmm. Many families didn't want to talk about it because of the way she, it, the deaths of the people yeah. were handled. I mean, first of all, you're talking about lifeboats that went down halfway, not even half halfway. filled. Um, you know, so many women lost their husbands, children lost their fathers. I mean, the third class passengers were all literally dead because they were told not to come up right because the first and second Mm -hmm. class were given seating first. I mean, you're talking about humanity here. You're talking about how things were done that weren't done right. Mm -hmm. You're talking about that the appearance of Titanic was more important Instead of putting 40 lifeboats on that top deck, they put 20. Right. So because, you know, they had to have the appearance of a bigger deck and because people had to have walking room and whatever. I mean, it was no wonder why there was so much anger and animosity when, they, you know, people came back. Right. Um, and everybody lost everything, yeah. um, you know. Yeah. It didn't matter how rich you were on that ship. You lost everything. Yeah. Um, you know, the first and the first and second class passengers, when they arrived on the Carpathia, I mean, they had nothing but the clothes on their backs. 
and that all they their were, possessions were gone. That was it. Mm-hmm. Everything, everything, you know, all their clothes, their jewelry, everything was at the bottom of the sea. Yeah. So here they are standing. I mean, when you think about it, if these are the only clothes I have, I'm naked yeah. practically because I have nothing left. And that's exactly what it was. Yeah. You know, part of it too was because the the Titanic wasn't outfitted properly. There mm-hmm. wasn't the, the flare that should have been on the crow's nest for fleet to, uh, to have, mm-hmm. it wasn't, weren't there. The things that were necessary weren't put there. It was, right. why? Why did this ship leave without the proper flares? Why, why, why did it leave without, without the, the um, without everything you binoculars need? Binoculars that were needed. I mean, fleet didn't even have a proper set of binoculars up in the crow's nest. He right. maybe, he could have seen he could have seen the, you know, the, the, the iceberg. So yeah. all of this, all of this that happened, families were angry when they finally found out. For sure. They were livid. And they didn't want to talk about Titanic. They, they, all they were thinking about is getting through the inquiry, getting through the trials, mm-hmm. and then finally whatever money, and I hate to put business on top of it, but whatever mm-hmm. money the Titanic could offer families so that mm-hmm. they could live and survive. Yeah. You know, especially families like my uncle's families. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you're talking about in in the um, town of Fabina, Alessandria alone, 42 families were left without fathers, mothers, and sisters. Oh that were on the Titanic yeah. because 37 of those people were men. The mm-hmm. rest of them were waitresses or, mm-hmm. you know, hostesses that were maids. on the, that worked, uh, you know, they, they, they weren't maids, but if they worked, when you worked in the a la carte, you just worked in the victualling. You worked That's in right. the restaurant. The, the a la carte restaurant had a completely separate operation system and wasn't even considered part of the white star line. Right. And that's another big reason. I'm glad you spoke about that because that's why, how my uncles died. They were told to go all the, now I want to backtrack and then we're going to go forward. Okay. The night the Titanic sank or was hit by the iceberg on April 14th, Mm -hmm. the Weiners who were very rich people, they were, um, they were the owner, Mrs. Weiner was one, an owner of a very long, of a very rich lingerie company. She wrote, mm. she, she owned, she owned and created her own lingerie and her own, her, her own clothing line. Very like the Duff Gordon. Exactly. Well, between she, Lady Duff Gordon and all the rich people, they had a magnificent di- dinner in the a la carte restaurant you know, specifically created with all the foods that Captain John Smith wanted. And they gave him his soiree because as we all know, when history tells, Mm -hmm. Captain Smith was going to retire, Mm -hmm. but the White Star Line called him in and asked him to, you know, captain and lead the Titanic Mm -hmm. leave one last voyage and then retire. Right. So he did. Mm -hmm. And everyone knew what was his last run. Mm -hmm. So the rich on the first class decided, let's give this man whom they had sailed with before on the Olympic, on the Olympic, a wonderful send off. Right. I'm sure he's never had a dinner like that before in his life. Most probably not. But if you think about this, now my uncles, Luigi Gotti and the rest of the staff were there feeling Mm -hmm. like masters of the culinary arts. Here we are, we have all the rich and elite in our very elite and beautiful restaurant. We're serving them. We're serving them the finest of dining you could ever receive. And now, 
We're being told to stay in our cabins. We cannot help people who need our help. What's that? What is that? Such a counterintuitive order. You would think what? you'd need everyone. Right. Right. So why is it that we're being told that we are not allowed to come up there to help? Mm -hmm. You know, we were just with everyone, everyone. Right. And yet you want us to stay here. Now, I do not know if this is true or not, but it is said that their cabin door was locked to keep them from coming up until an officer came down to open the door. Now, I still don't know if that's a myth. You really or if hope that's it is. For real. Because if when you think about it, if the people in steerage were locked mm -hmm. and weren't were told that they couldn't come up until the first and second class citizens were taken care of, mm -hmm. then why not lock them? But when you think about it, this ship is going down. Why are you locking people out of coming up the stairs? To Why is anyone lot? locked anywhere? It doesn't matter at this point in time. Just o open right. the doors. It, there is zero right. point in this, except if you want to bring guilt with you anywhere else. Well, then they're locked out of coming. Mm -hmm. My uncles with their crew are locked, you know, are not allowed out, you know, to come out. Yeah. So by the time all five compartments filled, they were drowning. They were, and I think, as I've written in the epilogue in my, in my book, what were they thinking, you know, while the water was filling up, you know, that here they were, the masters of culinary arts just hours ago, just minutes ago, and now I'm dying. I'm not allowed. What, what, what wait a minute. What, what, Why? Why am I dying in such despair when you just made me feel so important? And it was because they were subcontracted. It was because they were Italian, mm. you know, and I mean, we could put a racist issue or an indifference issue here or whatever kind of issue it is. But when you think about it, there was a mass, massive class system back yes. then, Alexia. Yeah, and there was also class there was also specifically anti-Italian sentiment at the time. Not to say that there that it gets any better, but especially you know there's a lot of cartoons at the time that depicted things, and it would have a caption like "Archibald Butt holds gun on rowdy Italian steerage passengers." It's like what that was unnecessary and horrible, but it was yeah. like you said, just it, it was just how they did things at the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, so this is why my family did not want to talk about the Titanic. Understandable. You know, let the dead lie because every single, I mean, Luigi Gotti's body was found. Mm -hmm. uh, six other members of the, um, the crew were found, but and Luigi's buried in Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, and um, the others are buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery. But mm -hmm. my uncles were never found. They're buried with Titanic, and so are the rest of them. That's yeah. their grave. And that's why the family would say, let them be in their grave. Let the dead be dead. Don't raise them. Don't touch them. Mm -hmm. You know, because... There was too much hurt there. Yeah. And that hurt just, you know, they say trauma is written in our DNA. Yeah. It is so true. It is. Because a friend of mine had said to me and a friend, his name is Adrian Saker. He is the president of the Titanic, you know, Memorial Lighthouse. Yes, yes. Where, where I, I recognize I the, the name. Right. Where I am the descendant advocate. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember when Adrian and I were talking about my uncles, he had said, you know, there's also another reason why, if you think about it, the passengers who survived never had an absolution from this. No. Because they lived with the guilt that here we, we, here we survived and everyone else died. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about 
you know, 735 people survived to 1,496 souls in a drink. I mean, yeah, it's, it's an astronomical difference when you, when you really actually break it down to numbers. Right. And when you think about it, it's so, wait a minute, 3,000 people on the Titanic Mm -hmm. bodies not found. Um, bodies found in by the McKay Bennett and, right. and probably people misidentified by accident or, well, if you go to the, if you go to the, to any of the cemeteries in, um, in Nova Scotia, whether it's the Baron de Hirsch, the Fairview Lawn or the uh, Mount Olivet. I've been in their cemeteries and Mm -hmm. there are bodies that have names on them because Mm -hmm. they were identified and there are bodies that just have a number. Right. It just says died April 15th, 1912 number, Mm -hmm. you know, a number. That's all it is. They are a number. There's no way of knowing. And when, you know, when you look at it in a history book, you feel one thing, but when you stand on those hallowed grounds as I have, let me tell you, you could actually feel them crying out to you. Who am I? Or where am I? Or, you know, it's like, who? you look down. I mean, mm-hmm. I could go to my father and mother's grave. And I know that by their pla- the plaque on their grave, mm-hmm. that's them. Right. Same with my grandparents. Same with, you know, Luigi Gotti. His number mm-hmm. is 313 and it is Luigi Gotti. Right. Same with Jay Dawson. Same with, you know, uh, the, the, Sydney, the Sydney Goodwin boy. Mm-hmm. We all, th- their name is on there. But, right. But when you stand looking at this grave without a name, it's like yeah. your heart, your heart hurts. Yeah. Because this this is an unidentified body. This is an unidentified life. Yeah. A whole life that somebody, somebody might be missing. I may still be missing and a family may still have questions about, and they're there, someone's standing on top of them and they're underneath just saying like, my name was, I don't know, Alice Smith. Doesn't, doesn't anybody care? Right. Or, you know, um, you know, it's terrible to think this, but you know the old the story about Bloody Mary, and I even hate to bring her up because it's it's a tar it's a yes. terrible story. But when you're standing on these graves, and you look down, and there's no there's an unidentified name, it's almost as though it is Bloody Mary, like they're scratching up to you, mm-hmm. saying, "I'm here." Yeah, I'm here. My name is here. Mm-hmm. My name. This is my name. Can you hear me? Yeah. And, and I think about families who were, who knew that that this person could have been on the ship, but where is that person buried now? Yeah. And there's, there is no closure for that family. No. And, you know, it's, it hurts. It hurts a lot. I think that's important to acknowledge though, is that as you mentioned a while ago, that trauma is through our DNA. It's things like this, like not knowing for so long what happened to your own brothers exactly that would that wouldn't i would i don't think i'd be able to live with that i'm very close to my brother and you know i i the, having that sort of mystery would be it would create a rift that's hard to fix no matter how much time has passed simply because no matter how much time has passed nothing becomes more clear if anything it just becomes st- stranger and more upsetting <laughs> Exactly. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, my, my mom, my mom was born here in America in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. My dad was born here in America and Mm -hmm. I met, I knew my grandparents on his side and I knew my grand, I, my grandfather on my father's side died when I was six. Mm -hmm. My grandmother died when I was 14, but I knew them and I still Mm -hmm. remember them. I mean, my parents, thank God I had my mother until I was 32. She died 33 years ago. 
Mm -hmm. And up and actually, I'm emotional today because today is the 12th anniversary of my father's passing. He, um, you know, he was 87 when he died. So, you know, I knew these people. Yeah. They were my mom. They were my dad. They were my grandparents. And I knew them. So when I go to their graves, I know who they are. Yes. But now my mother, my mother's parents, I never met them. So right. when I go to their grave. And once in a while, I do go to my grandparents' grave just to put a flower on to also remember my mom because she would visit the grave. Yeah. But Alexia, I never knew them. So I stand on top of this grave and who are you to me? I know that you're my grandparents because my mom told me you were, but Mm -hmm. that's a trauma in my DNA because I never knew them. I mean, the only way I I grew to know them was through my, you know, my aunts and uncles tell Mm -hmm. me about them, my cousins who met them to tell me about them, my mom, of course, who would talk to me about them. Mm -hmm. So, but I never knew them personally. And I felt for ZMO that way too, because knowing that I didn't know my grandparents and he only knew his brothers until he was four years old, five years old, to be a little boy and not know, not grow up with the with the two young men that you worshipped. They were your brothers. They were your older brothers. You know, these were the boys who were supposed to help rear you as a man. Yeah. And yet they weren't there. They, they turned into the you know, boys that didn't come home. Right. Right. Exactly. So the mystery of who my brothers were and why, why was I shut out from them? So that's one of the reasons why I took, why I I took the task of finding out who they were. Little did I know that the, that falling in love with Titanic, Titanic when I was 17 Mm -hmm. was only going to bring me forward into a lifetime of being with her. Yeah. You know, I always tell everyone Titanic has a way. No, Titanic chooses you. I always Mm -hmm. say this, Titanic chooses who she wants to memorialize her, to bring her forward. She knows who will respect her. She knows who will understand her death. Mm -hmm. She knows. She's a lady of class and esteem and elegance. Exactly. But she also, you know, people tell me, well, how do you know how she was a ship? She was made of iron. So what? But that piece of iron, that beautiful maiden piece of iron held 3000 souls on exactly. her that lived in that, that died in that hull. Mm-hmm. So 3000 souls are in that ship. Exactly. And whether, whether they lived when they died, they were still with Titanic because mm-hmm. that's, the burden they carried. And that burden follows in the DNA of others who are chosen to bring it forward. Mm -hmm. And it was burdened in mine. And, you know, it is an elegant burden. It is a, it is a hard burden, but it's also a joyful burden because Mm -hmm. she's given me so much love because the love I give, the love you give Titanic is the love she gives you back. Agree. I mean, with all the people I've met through Titanic, you know, the publishers of my book, D, D and um, D Ryan Meister and her husband Neil Neil Meister. I mean, they were they're fantastic people. Charles Haas, you know. Adrian Saker, I mean, mm-hmm. all these wonderful people, Jul- Julia, Jill Collier, who is the president of the Titanic Book Club. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are people that I would have never met mm-hmm. in my life and who have made, who have t- taken me into their family. And I'm so grateful to, for Titanic, you know? 
I've always, for, for me personally, I've always found that Titanic is a human story because there is Titanic, the ship, like you mentioned, the iron and the wood and the rivets. And then there is the, I think more of like Titanic, the concept, the legacy, the stories, the people, the inquiries and the lessons. And not that they're two separate things, they're all one big thing, but I think that that legacy is important. And you're right, I think that it does choose people because the last survivor is no longer with us. They're, the survivors are gone. There are no more of them left to tell their story. The only people that are left to tell the story of Titanic are second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth degrees of separation away from the origin story. So it's important for people who feel that calling to continue to tell that story, because otherwise we wouldn't learn about your uncles. We wouldn't learn about so many of the other names and faces that are, no pun intended, coming to the surface now that we have the volume for these important stories. Exactly. And for me, for me to be a part of it mm -hmm. is an honor and a privilege because you know, Titanic was a maiden. Mm -hmm. She was, she, she was this wonderful ship of beauty made by the hands of men in Belfast Lock mm -hmm. who toiled on her and gave her her grace and watched her launch on that beautiful day and, 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 and when she set sail, the pride knowing that she was sailing mm -hmm. and then the death. Yeah. All that work, all that sweat, all of it. I mean, a piece of them went down with her. Yeah. You know, I mean, Titanic took many pieces, many hearts with her. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's why when she chooses you, she makes sure that you will tell the story truthfully because of so many things that were hidden in history. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm very honored and privileged to be in her family. Yeah. Well, do you have any more questions for me? I I have one quick question. I was wondering if you could tell me again your uncle's full names and maybe how old they were when, when, when they died for people who might want to look up look them up a little more. Well, their names were Alberto Paracchio, or actually Paracchio is the American um, is the American pronunciation. It's only mm -hmm. Paracchio. Paracchio. So, right. It's Alberto Paracchio and Sebastiano Paracchio. Mm -hmm. And my book is Titanic, the Brothers Paraccio, Two Boys in a Dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Which I did not get in enough time to read before this interview because that would have involved planning on my part. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to read it. <laughs> I think I see it in the back with your it other is. Titanic books. Yes, it is. It's right there. Yep. It kept falling over, so I had to prop something in front of it. Uh, it fell on my dog. <laughs> like, oh, no. Oh, no. Poor He's dog. <laughs> yeah, well, before we log off, I want yeah. to... I mean, the picture in the book is small, but this yeah, is a bigger I picture of them. them. They were so young. So, so very handsome. So young. But there is one thing of the tale I haven't told you. Oh. There's a... The, in the book, if anybody orders my book, which they two, all should, right? They they will see two pictures of the boys. They cameo pictures, mm -hmm. and if you the cameo pictures show Alberto wearing a bow tie, mm -hmm. and Sebastiano wearing a silk, wearing an orchid. The yes. orchid the orchid is made of silk. It's not real. Uh -huh. It was made by his mom because oh. she was a seamstress. And so was the bow, the bow tie was made by, you know, by his, their mom. Oh, she so told, she told her sons that if you ever take a picture mm -hmm. and if you, you know, or when you're happy, wear these, you know, to know that mama is with you. Oh. And 
you know, these, these are the things I learned from cousins, you know, who finally told me. And they took those pictures. The pictures I just showed you were actually taken in the back of the, of the a la carte restaurant on Titanic. Wow. And yeah, they were sent into archives. That's why I'm lucky enough to get them, to those have them. So, those are, first of all, they're beautiful pictures. And um, beautiful. so when mama finally, when mama received those pictures, at least she knew, even though she received those pictures after the Titanic sank, at least she knew that her sons were happy. And they were really, really proud to have their photo taken on the Titanic wearing the things their mother had made for them. Mm -hmm. And to be, they were, they were proud. I mean, I mean, they were, when I think about if they had lived the women they could have married and the beautiful sons and daughters they would have made because they were so handsome. Oh, they, they would have had people falling off the gangplank in New York to oh. get to them. They were very <laughs> good looking. Oh, yes, they were. They were extremely good looking men. And um, it's stories like theirs that catch catch me with Titanic. It's because, you know, you, you hear all those big names, but it, you think about these shiny happy young men who were starting their lives and just probably thinking like wow this is it this is it this is the beginning of my life it's exactly how everyone felt when you think titanic started off in belfast lock mm -hmm. being built right created by strong men strong hands proud men big irish hands right then, then she comes to England where she's outfitted the rest of the way. She's, you know, she, her accoutrement is, mm -hmm. is, you know, put in her and she, the, the, um, the expensive furniture and, and, and oh, everything trimming. is done, you know, to its finest to, for her to look like the queen of the sea that she was. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want to work on somewhere on that? Who would not want to be a part of that? Right. It's you want, the thing and of then, the day. And then you want to come here to America knowing that like the Irish and the the Irish and the European Irish, Swedish, German immigrants mm -hmm. and all the any anyone else who came from Pakistan or whatever, those immigrants who had a third class steering, mm -hmm. you know, they knew they were coming to a better life, a life mm -hmm. to start over a life where maybe jobs were already, you know, present for them. Mm -hmm. The second class citizens knew that they were coming, they were either, either they had some money to travel for a change mm -hmm. or this was going to be once of a lifetime deal. Right. I'm on the world's famous ship and that's it. It'll yep. take my money, but so what, you know, the rest I'm of my life, a new life, right. The rest of my life, I'll know that. Okay. You know, I could always make it up. Right. And the first class, of course, was right. the ones that history was supposed to be created with. Exactly. And then nothing. And then it was all, it's all gone in under three hours. Mm -hmm. Every piece of everything. I think that's what, what's so hard for people to believe. It's not at the bottom of the sea, it wasn't just iron and china and forks, but it was life savings and dowries and wedding gowns and dreams. Exactly. 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 Well, I am uh, sorry. I was like, I, I, it's so interesting to hear. I don't call, I don't want to call them small stories, but the stories of the people that we haven't got to hear from before. Because it is important to acknowledge that not only they existed, but that their stories were important and that they were people who had lives and families who loved them and very much missed them when they were gone. I know. I know. It's. Yeah, it's it's funny. When I finally found them. Mm -hmm and started really knowing who they were. And when I went to um, 
Canada and I stood at the gravesite of Luigi Gotti. I remember D, I had gone in 2018 and I was getting ready to do my final, some of my research with D. Ryan Meister. And I finally met Richard McMichael, who was the interpreter of the uh, Nova Scotia Museum. Oh, wow. You know, to the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, I'm sorry, in Nova Scotia. Uh -huh. And all I remember is thinking, I put my hands on that gravestone and I knew I was home. I knew I was home because I knew this was my uncle's boss. Yeah. This was Fubina Alessandria. I was holding Italy right there. This this is where this is who where they came from. And many people wouldn't believe, don't believe if they, if they're if they do believe it. I felt like my uncles, one was on one side, one was on the other, holding my shoulders. Mm. And I started to cry and that's when you realize how real this is. Yeah. It's not a romantic story. A ro it's real. It doesn't have to be. You know, and I, I, whether people, I believe her or not, but, you know, you found them for someone who was looking for them. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the way I, why would they not be there? If for no other reason than to be saying like, hey, Thanks for finding that out for him. Means I know. a lot. <laughs> I know. And every time I do something for them, something good happens to me. That's amazing. Always. I always feel that way. Something good happens to me because, you know, they know that I'm not leaving them alone. No. I mean, when you think about, when you think about being 17 and 20, and dying alone. Unfathomable. Uh, it is. Unfathomable. Before but... we continue, it's 310. Uh, How much... I was going to say, I was about to um, thank you for your time and let you go because I was not going to keep you for much longer. Mostly just because I'm sure you have a bunch of other things to do. <laughs> yeah, I actually have to... I'm um... going to stop the record on this. I want to thank Angelica again so, so much for coming on the show. I could have talked to her for another, I don't know, like 100,000 years. Um, but if you want to read her book, which you totally, totally, totally should, um, her book is called Titanic, The Brothers Paracchio, Two Boys in a Dream. Um, and Paracchio is spelled P-E-R-A-C-C. H I O and you can get in touch with her on Twitter. That's how I found her. Um, and her Twitter handle is at Angelica Titanic. That is all one word. And I want to thank her again so much for coming on the show to talk about her book, her family, her experience and her life. And, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with the show, please do send me an email at Titanic talkline at gmail.com or get in touch with me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. The username for any of those sites is Titanic talkline and I'll see you in the next time. Bye.